Right, we've got a number of participants with us. Um, I believe that some more will filter in as, um, as we get underway. Um, but as we have some time pressure, um, I think it would be best to kick things off. So in the first instance, um, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us for this code hosted webinar. Um, since the world of hospitality has been turned upside down and we've been forced into isolation, uh, we're bringing as much of our offering online to provide some support and entertainment during lockdown. Today we are joined by restaurant PR and communication specialist, Hugh Wright. Many of you will know Hugh or will certainly have seen his work with some of London's favourite restaurants. Big thanks to Hugh for joining us. Um, following my introduction, Hugh will guide us through his approach uh, to tackling com communications in a crisis. Um, we'll then have a few minutes for some questions at the end. If you would like to ask a question during this webinar, uh, please type it in the chat function on the toolbar um, and we can field them afterwards. Uh, we do have a strict 30 minute duration, so we may not be able to answer all questions. However, we will be following up um, with everybody afterwards um, so we can answer some outstanding ones then. Um, the transition to digital is new for all of us. Um, so please be patient if we do have any technical difficulties. Um, again, we will be sharing slides from the presentation with you afterwards should you miss anything. Um, all attendees have been muted and your cameras are off. Um, so please don't change these settings during the webinar as it may interfere. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Hugh, who, um, who will take things away for us. I'm just going to pop your camera on, Hugh, so everyone can see you. Hello, everyone. This is exciting. Um, thank you, Ed, for that very um, generous and warm introduction. I'm really delighted to have been asked by Code Hospitality to host this webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to communicate in a crisis, not just the current crisis that we find ourselves in as an industry, although I will be spending some time on that later. One thing that the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has really shown up is a lot of people don't have crisis communication plans in place or even communication plans at all. So a few people have been caught with their pants down and hopefully you'll take away some tips today um, that will enable you not just to deal with communications in the current crisis but going forward for your business. The topics that we'll be covering, um, I'm going to start off by just you know, setting some definitions of what counts as a crisis, so when to act and when not to. We'll then look at what I call the communications toolbox. It sounds a bit jargony, but really it's just a few uh, measures, people, uh, procedures uh, and so on that you can have in place to make sure that you're well equipped to deal with any crisis that might arise. We'll then be looking at what to do, so what counts as effective crisis communications and very importantly what not to do. I've subheaded it there, don't make a drama out of a crisis. There's a reason that old quip exists. And then, as I said, I will be spending some time looking specifically at some ways that you can communicate during the current uh, COVID-19 crisis. And then, as Ed said, at the end, we'll have some time for some questions and answers. Um, so we'll kick off by um, starting with, we'll look at what counts as a crisis. So a crisis is, an unforeseen event which has the potential to cause serious or lasting harm to your business. That unforeseen is really important. Um, known issues or issues that you could reasonably be expected uh, to know about um, should form part of your ongoing communications and PR strategy. If you don't have one, it's probably time that you did have one. Um, so a crisis is something that's unforeseen um, that needs an immediate and urgent response. I think it's the difference between seeing your GP, an accident and emergency. You would see your GP for your ongoing health, so that's your communications and PR strategy, and then crisis communications is a &E, it's when you've got an emergency. A crisis can be something that hasn't gone public yet. This is really important. It's something that could happen that you know isn't yet in the public domain. If you act quickly and you act effectively, it may never go into the public domain. I always say, and only half joking, that crisis communications is the dark art of public relations. It's the dark art because if you're really good at it, there's no proof that you ever did anything. You know, no one ever says, oh yeah, you know that thing that you never heard about, that was me. If something has gone public, effective crisis communications can contain it and can mitigate it. A 
crisis is a specific actual event or action that is happening to you and is happening to you now. Oh, we've jumped ahead a slide. If we could possibly just go back one, Ed. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, brilliant. It's, a, it's something that is happening to you and that is happening now. It's not something that's happening in the wider industry that doesn't directly affect you. Um, in the current crisis that we find ourselves in, some, very few, but there are some um, operators who actually they aren't affected, they're affected in as much as they're closed, but you know, financially they're able to get through it, their staff are all furloughed, their business is effectively mothballed, you know, they're okay, and that's brilliant, <laughs> by the way. Um, so really, they don't need crisis communications because they don't have a crisis. It's affecting other people, but not them directly, and it's important to keep those separate. And then it's also very important to separate the professional from the personal. Um, obviously, something that's happening to someone in your business, yourself or one of your team, uh, can absolutely have an impact on your business as a whole, but it doesn't always. Someone getting divorced, you know, someone in a messy court case. If it's a private matter, it's a private matter. You don't need to make it your business to communicate about it. So weigh that up very carefully. The communications toolbox, things that you can have in place to make sure that you're really well equipped to deal with any crisis that might arise. Regardless of company size, and this is one I would say is the most important, have a dedicated person whose role it is to lead and respond in the event of a crisis. A recent example, and I won't name names, um, but in a recent example of um, an issue that arose for a quite high profile um, hospitality business on social media, no one responded for over 12 hours. It happened late one evening. They didn't respond until sort of lunchtime the next day. And then when they did respond, sort of two leaders within the business both tried to sort of take charge. And, you know, with you know, great respect for them, neither of them did an especially good job. You need to have one person who takes charge. You should also have a documented crisis communication strategy just in case that person isn't available when a crisis arises but also so that they've got something to follow so they can sort of tick things off as they go. It doesn't have to go into particularly fine detail. It doesn't have to be a very lengthy document, but just some key pointers about who's in charge, what's expected of them and what they should be doing. Make sure that's written down and make sure people know where to find it. Something else you really need to have um, on file, <coughs> excuse me, not COVID-19. You need to know how to update your own social media, website, blog, Google listings, TripAdvisor page, and so on. It might sound really obvious, but the thing is a lot of businesses, small and large, outsource that. It is time consuming. I, for example, am in charge of the social media for most of my clients. You might not always be able to get hold of the person who you know, does your website, does your social, you know, in a crisis, it could be late at night, it could be, you know, wee small hours of the morning. So make sure, you know, they always say, don't write down your PIN number, don't write down your passwords, but do keep them on file somewhere and know how to manage them and access them yourself. You don't want to be delayed in responding because you don't know your Twitter password. Listening is the most effective communication tool there is. This makes me sound a bit like a marriage guidance counsellor, but what I mean by that is, at all times, you should be listening to what people are saying about you, where they're saying it, you know, how people feel about you. Understanding sentiment, by which I mean how people perceive your business, how they feel about you, how they interact with you, is really important. Knowing what is expected of you in terms of tone and content when a crisis arises comes from listening. And then, if in any doubt, ask an expert and ideally ask them first. Sounds like I'm pitching for business, I promise you I'm not, but you know there is a reason why people make a living from communications. There is a skill set to it and so if you are serious about you know, communicating well and particularly about communicating well in a crisis, take some tips, you know, speak to a consultant, speak to an expert, you know, if you don't have the budget to retain a PR full-time, you know, most PR agencies, myself included, will at the very least you know, be able to do consultancy for you and help you with some pointers so that you can do things yourself. So, should a crisis arise, here's what to do. It's really important to respond quickly, even if you don't have an answer or what feels like a perfect solution right away. Bad news doesn't age well. There's that old quote often misattributed to Mark Twain uh, about a, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth has even got its boots on. And that's very true. In the time that you spend you know, crafting what you think is like the ideal response, the situation could get worse. So respond quickly. 
Stick your head above the parapet in a time of crisis. Show that you're aware of it. Show that you're dealing with it and that you're taking it seriously. The worst thing that you can do is seem to be sort of hiding away from things. The sooner you can say, yep, we know about this. We're dealing with it. You know, we're, it's really important to us. You know, it's, it shows that you're in charge. If you can, take it offline. Most conversations these days do arise, you know, on social media or in a public platform. So by taking it offline, I mean, contacting the person say yes okay we're really aware of this what's your number or what's your email address and we will be in touch bear in mind though some people not necessarily maliciously but they might want it to play out in public i've seen it happen before where someone said oh can we have your phone number so we can give you a call and someone has said no i contacted you here i'd like you to respond here don't feel trapped into that and communicating the way that you don't want to but just be aware that you might not be able to take it offline when you do, make sure that any, anything you say, whether it's in a private message on you know, social media, whether it's in email, whether it's you know, in, in writing, if we're really old school, don't say anything that you wouldn't want to be made public. You know, again, it's people do screen grab things. They will screen grab private conversations. So just because something is called a private message, you can't rely on it remaining private. So don't say anything to someone privately that you wouldn't be perfectly happy with a wider audience seeing. When you respond, make sure it's honest, sincere, uh, and, uh, and personal and tailored. Avoid cliches. Um, you know, we've all seen these non-apologies where it says, oh, we're sorry if anyone was upset, or, you know, we're going, you know, lessons will be learned so that we can, you know, learn from this in future. Everyone's heard it all before. It's better to say something clumsily than to say something insincere you know something that comes from the heart will always you know it will always be obvious that it is honest and make sure it's tailored to the situation you know don't go cutting and pasting someone else's response you know don't borrow from others language is finite you know there's bound to be things that you will say that other people will have said before but say them from the heart once you've responded and hopefully contained your crisis or turned it into a non-crisis make sure that people know what you've done it's your it's your opportunity to take ownership of the narrative show that you're in charge of this situation um, you know put a statement whether it's on your website or on your social media um, in a newsletter for example you know any means of communication with your customers to show what you've done to just say yes this happened took it really seriously, we responded straight away, these are the steps that we took. That will reflect really well and you will own the narrative that way. And then throughout any crisis, however short or long, you know, or long lived it might be, make sure you look after your people and yourself. Crises are really emotionally draining. You know, if you have, you know, screwed up and screwed up quite publicly, remember that, you know, your staff might be getting a hard time on their own social media channels from their friends, family. So make sure that they're supported and make sure that you're supported too. It is a stressful time. It's also important in terms of looking after your, um, looking after your people to make sure that they know who is dealing with this and who they should refer any inquiries to. They shouldn't be responding to people on social media or even privately. You know, you should have a line, you know, I said right at the beginning, have a dedicated person. Make sure your team know who that is. So if you get any inquiries, make sure they go to Sarah, you know. Um, but, you know, look after them and look after yourself. A few things not to do. How not to make a drama out of a crisis. I said before, respond quickly. And again, I'll emphasize that. Don't delay responding while you're deciding what to do or, you know, get, or getting legal advice. Buy yourself time with a holding response, but silence is deadly. You know, that example I gave before of a situation that wasn't even, it wasn't addressed, you know, it wasn't even responded to until the next day. Um, yes, of course, you're gonna to want to take advice. And as I said, you know, you should be speaking to experts. Um, but yes, silence is deadly. Get a response out there. It can and will evolve. It won't be perfect straight away, but it's better to say something quickly than say nothing later on. When you are responding, don't say too much. Keep it simple. This is really important because sometimes the tendency when something goes wrong is to issue a very sort of lengthy mea culpa. People feel that they need to go into immense detail about, um, about the situation but the more you say the more there is for people to pick holes in you know people will have a tendency you might publish your response in a thread of 20 tweets most people will read one or two of them you know keep it simple keep it tight don't leave things out but don't feel that you have to go into great detail it's not your friend in a situation like this 
don't hide behind legalese, data protection, company policy. It really gets people's backs up. You know, it used to be health and safety. It was like, oh, for health and safety reasons. You know, GDPR is the new health and safety. It's like, oh, you know, we can't say this because of. You can take responsibility without admitting liability. You can say, we are very sorry that this happened. That's not the same as saying this happened and absolutely it's our fault. You know, I always think the worst thing that can happen to a restaurant would be, say, you know, a food poisoning incident or outbreak. Saying we're very sorry that this happened and this is what we've done to put it right is different from saying we're very sorry that we poisoned those people. You know, if you're in any doubt, yes, of course, you can take legal advice, but don't hide behind it. People smell that a mile off. <clears throat> don't be defensive. That's really important. You know, don't be defensive and say, oh, you know, it's this is really hard for us. People care about how you're dealing with the situation. But equally, don't feel you have to admit to something that you don't feel is true just to pacify people. If you genuinely don't feel that you've done something wrong, say so, but be prepared to back it up. Be able to say why. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to own up to something that you don't feel that you've done, but there's a reason why people feel that you have. So, you know, be clear. And, you know, have your facts to hand. Um, but, you know, don't be overly defensive. And then finally, this one's really important, but probably the most difficult. Don't get angry and don't get personal. I've seen it happen where, for example, restaurants have received a really scathing review and it's horrible. It really hurts. But if you get angry about it and you get personal and you start sort of making personal jibes about the critic or the reviewer or the customer, the only person it is going to reflect badly on is you. It might feel good at the time, it won't later. So just moving on then to our final slide, and then I'm looking at the countdown, we will have some time for questions. Specifically looking at PR and communications uh, during this current crisis, the outbreak of COVID-19, it is unlike anything any of us have dealt with before, but there, here are some pointers which you know, I hope will be helpful to you. Keep communicating. This is really important. Even though you're closed or you might have switched to, for example, delivery or collection only, you still exist. Don't let people forget about you. They're still interested in you. The people who follow you on social media when you're open and posting new content several times a week are still interested in you now. It's absolutely fine to keep on marketing your business. And in fact, it's essential to keep on marketing your business, even though people can't access it in the usual way. Think about what's relevant now. What would you be doing? What recipes would you be talking about? What produce, what suppliers? Still talk about those things. It's still good. People still want to know what your business does. There might be people, you know, with more time on their hands now who are putting together lists of where they want to eat when all this is over. So do keep marking yourself and don't apologize for it. You've still got a business, even though the way you're doing business has changed. See this time as an opportunity to really engage with your customers in a way that you might not usually have time to. Often marketing for, so for restaurants and social media can be very one directional. It can be very much, let us tell you about this thing that we're doing. You've got the time now and the opportunity to ask your customers about themselves, get to know them, share their content. You know, this is a time where you can let your, you know, your social media strategy, your marketing plan, your brand identity, you can let it slip a bit. You can relax. You can share those imperfect photos or, you know, fun videos that normally might not be on brand for you. It'll create a more personal, you know, a, a more personal engagement with your customers. And that is something that you will benefit from, you know, when everything goes back to normal, they'll remember the fun they had. As far as you can be original, I know this is difficult, but as a general rule, if everyone else is doing something, that's a good reason for you not to. This is a new situation. We're all finding our feet. So, you know, there is no rule book, but you know, there is already a lot of very similar content and it's already visible that people are starting to get fatigued by, it. you know, they're thinking, oh God, not another, you know, cook along or not another, you know, home cocktail recipe. That's not to say don't do those things, but do them in an original way that is personal to you and really reflects who you are, not what everyone else is doing. And then this final one, I said, remember that a good deed is still a good deed, even if no one knows you're doing it. So I've included that because I've had interesting conversations with with um, operators, clients, you know, restaurateurs that fall in sort of one of two camps. Lots of people are doing lots of really amazing stuff at the moment. There was a lovely piece by Marina O'Loughlin for the Sunday Times um, this week, rounding up some of the great things that people are doing. Marina herself said, I wish I could list all of them. So there are some people who are doing amazing things and, you know, really dedicating a lot of time and effort, money and resource to, you know, doing things, for example, for the NHS. 
but aren't necessarily getting any publicity for it. And that's hard because, you know, there is no, it's not a dirty word to want to get a little bit of kudos for doing something that you're doing. But as Marina said in her piece, there's so much good being done that it's, you know, not everyone is going to get mentioned. It might seem a little bit unfair, but it's still a great thing that you're doing. Equally, I've spoken to people who are doing these things, but would be mortified for it to be included in the press, you know, because they don't want it to look like they're doing it purely for sort of attention or, or you know, or, or benefit or because everyone else is doing it. So they want to stay out of the press and that's absolutely fine as well. Equally, if you're not doing anything other than just trying to keep your head above water, that's also absolutely fine. So there we are. So we've looked at what counts as a crisis. We've looked at how to deal with it and how not to deal with it and some communications tools to have in your toolbox. Um, and we've looked at some specifics for communicating in the current crisis. Now we have a few minutes left for some questions and answers. And I'm looking, I don't know, Ed, do you want to moderate these? Shall I sort of read from? Yeah, thanks ever so much for that, Hugh. It was really informative. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I've noticed that a couple of questions have, um, yeah, of course, a couple of questions have um, arisen in the, uh, the chat box. If anyone else would like to submit some, um, we've got five minutes or so where Hugh can uh, field them. Um, but I'll hand back over to you, Hugh. Great, thanks Ed. So yeah, there's a couple of great questions here. Okay, so one of them from Adam. Is now the time to start putting together a PR marketing plan for coming out of lockdown, whenever that may be? Any tips for doing this? Yes, absolutely. Assuming that just about everywhere is going to be reopening at the same time, there's going to be, you know, a lot of noise going on. And like with the good deeds I was talking about, you know, you do want to stand out. So Absolutely, yes, I would put together a plan. I mean, if you don't already have a PR marketing plan, now's a good opportunity to be doing one for going forward anyway. Um, so yes, absolutely use this time, because a lot of people I work with, particularly smaller clients, they say we don't have the time to put together a sort of a 12 month marketing plan or even a six month marketing plan. Now's the time. Um, in terms of any tips for doing this, um, just really the things I was talking about in terms of originality, sincerity, um, use this time to, you know, like I say, talk to your customers, ask them what they want to be hearing about, ask them what they want to hear from you and factor that into your plan for coming out of lockdown, which I am really, really looking forward to. Um, message, a uh, question from Roxy, what's the optimum time to reply to complaints put out a formal response to a crisis? Is a holding response better than no response? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Speed is absolutely of the essence. And as soon as a crisis arises or something that you, you know, feel counts as a crisis, get a response out. I mean, immediately, if you can. As I've said, it doesn't have to cover everything. It doesn't have to be a detailed response. But just say, yes, we're aware of this. Yes, we're dealing with it. That's the key thing. Your response can and will evolve. But yes, it's really super important to say yes. Um, I have another, oh blimey, they are coming in at a fair old clip. Um, okay, you say don't stay silent. We had an incident where a violent customer was removed from the premises and we had to lock in customers and staff until police arrived. He was charged and it made into the papers. We were constantly contacted by the papers to comment but did not want to get dragged into it. We stayed silent and feel it was right. Absolutely, absolutely, and I support that fully. Um, as I said, uh, I know I said sort of silence is deadly, but what I meant by that was you know, just pretending that it's not there. But if a situation arises and you feel in your best judgment that the best response is no response, that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine to say no comment. And it sounds like that worked out really well for you. So yes, I think it's really important to evaluate it. What I would say is when you've got a situation like that, do you just have a very short standard response it can feel a bit repetitive but does have a very short standard response that you can send to everyone so that everyone is getting the same response so for example in your situation i would say um, an incident occurred that was managed by us at the time and we have nothing further to add have just a very short statement and give that statement to everyone so there's consistency but it sounds like you handled that really well um, oh when do you predict hospitality normal come back let me get my crystal ball. Um, I've really got no idea. I wish I did. My instinct, and this is purely instinct, is I would say <clears throat> hopefully within the next couple of months. I think um, if you look at countries like Korea, where a good friend and client of mine is at the moment, um, you know, restaurants are already reopening. Hospitality businesses are already reopening. Oh, really? Sorry, Hugh. It looks like we're going to run out of time. 
Um, oh, it would be so, thanks ever so much. Um, we will pick up that question um, and and get back to you, Liam. Um, yeah. I think we're going to be addressing that over the coming well, weeks. Feel free to email me. My email address should be on your screens. Um, do feel free to drop me a line. I'd be very happy to hear from you. I do have time on my hands to reply. Excellent. No, I really, really appreciate that, Hugh, and I'm sure everybody else does. Um, we will be following up with everyone with the slides and a recording, so it can go far and wide as well. Um, but yeah, just thanks again to you, Hugh. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to speak to everyone. Your expertise is really, really um, welcomed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Well, goodbye. <laughs>